Okay, so the, it's a nebulous definition. It means any computer system with architecture above uh, average performance. And we also have a specific, more so, uh, another nebulous definition, which is what constitutes supercomputers. Basically, any machine that is in the forefront of um, a number of processing metrics that are available at a particular point in time. Uh, typically, we would have measurements such as how many floating point operations per second it can do. Um, that's a popular metric used by the top 500, not necessarily the best metric because, of course, there are such things like how fast do you get your um, RAM, so like, you know, um, uh, how fast do you access your RAM, how fast do you do any sort of computational problems. Once upon a time, it, all began, it was all in the world of vector processors, um, which in some roundabout ways are kind of similar to so like your GP, GPUs today. It's so like you know, single instruction um, over, multiple pros, over multiple data sets. Um, however, last 20 years or so, it has been clustered computers that have become dominant. And the reason for that is that um, their architecture is particularly useful, um, their cost is uh, quite low in comparison. Um, so basically we are developing systems where you have a bundle, um, a bundle of sort of like compute nodes and they are managed a little bit like a Teamster system with a, um, a management node or a, and or a um, uh, login node for um, the users to submit their tasks and they run off and they get broken up um, across the various compute, um, compute nodes. Um, this means that we're engaging in some sort of level of parallel computing, whether we're splitting it up into tasks, task parallelism. So, you know, when you're driving a car, you know, you've got your eyes doing one task, your hands doing another task, your feet doing another task. That's an example of task parallel systems. Or you can do data parallelism where you're effectively doing the same thing but across different data sets. So, Clustered HPC systems are the most efficient, economical, and scalable computing systems in the world today, and they dominate supercomputers. And a very nice thing for those of you who are in the open source world is that, as you can see, Linux makes up 488 of the top 500, and a handful of other BSD systems, and so on and so forth. Um, this is actually a increase over previous year's metrics, and um, has basically been a huge turn over the, sort of the last um, decade, uh, about the last 15 years, when once upon a time the proprietary Unixes like held the top spots there. Also, scientific computing applications tend to be um, open source products as well. Um, in fact, it's actually quite an annoying thing when we come across closed source scient uh, scientific applications because um, we cannot optimise them, we can't get them to like, operate according to the com you know, best compilers we have and so on and so forth. So in the high performance computing world, we love open source. You know, we think it's the greatest thing in the world and we do our best to like, um, give some feedback and contribute back to it as well. And here's a picture. I tend to do some fairly boring um, slideshows, um, but you know I will break up my sort of like wall of text with the occasional image. This is the world's fastest machine. This is the top number one supercomputer in the world. Has been number one actually for um, more than one um, iteration of the top 500, which is very unusual. Uh, Tiani Two in or Milky Way Two um, in China clocks in a very nice uh, 38 or so teraflops. There's our picture. So, why do we use high performance computing? Because we have got very big data sets and those data sets are getting bigger and they are getting bigger faster than, um, faster than unicore um, applications or desktop systems are able to do the computation that is required. If there is a takeaway message from here, if you are in a research institute and you are not providing access to high performance computing facilities, your research institute will die. There is very good research that's coming out now that's showing that paper output and so on and so forth is in, um, has got a very strong correlation with those institutes that provide their researchers access to HPC facilities. Um, we have things like the Square Kilometre Array coming on the agenda, which will be collecting more data um, per day than what the um, entire internet does in a year. This, need, this data needs storage and processing and so forth. So, 
We do find that our HPC systems, our supercomputers, are used primarily in scientific computing, going out there, producing the, making the discoveries and inventions that make the world a better place, but not exclusively so. Um, our friends from New Zealand will, um, uh, will wax lyrically and justifiably about um, the Wetter Institute, which uses um, high-performance computing for CGI in certain films that involve hobbits. Is this going to move ahead for me? Come on. There we go. Okay. Um, I'm based in Melbourne, Victoria, and we've had a couple of examples of successes with high performance computing. Um, just like uh, two, which I will mention from the previous five years. Um, 2010, we unraveled how the protein perforon attacks rogue cells. We've known that sort of white blood cells attack sort of like the nasties in the body for quite some time. We weren't too sure how they did it. We just knew that they did it. Um, we've now sort of been able to simulate and get the empirical evidence that they basically form this torus-like structure on the rogue cell, puncture it like a donut cutter, and that breaks that cell membrane and kills the nasty cell. Hooray, high-performance computing did that. Um, more recently, we've been able to do simulations with um, antifreeze proteins. Um, this actually is like a spin-off from a little study that was in, done in Antarctica involving why certain species of fish don't freeze when they get in contact with you know, super cold water. Um, that then got transferred over onto um, an ice cream manufacturer who used it as a sculpting agent. Now we also find out that we could actually use it to prevent uh, crop frost damage, which is um, a very expensive and nasty problem. So two examples of successes of high performance computing. And here's two more pictures. There's, um, um, there's an example of the perforin protein and there is a poor tree that has suffered the um, uh, a berry tree that suffered the oh, sorry, citrus tree that suffered the unfortunate effects of um, crop frost losing so like some substantial amount of um, some nice uh, nice citrus fruits. So it's not good enough just to provide high-performance computing. You've got to teach people how to use it. And that is, that is a reality. And um, one of the organisations that provides both uh, the provisioning of high-performance computing and the teaching is uh, VPAC, Victorian Partnership for Advanced Computing, or V3 Alliance. Um, we came together... VPAC like started in 2000, back in the days when the university said, hey, we really need high-performance computing, but we can't afford to uh, purchase it um, ourselves, so let's put some money into the kitty and start uh, paying for it collectively. Um, in 2013, we merged with the Victorian E Research Institute, which made a bit of sense because the institutions were saying, why do we have two organisations? Um, and we've also got a commercial spin-off company called VPAC Innovations. So we're a combination of the two. We provided some training in the early 2000s based on people who like, said, hey, um, we need to use these supercomputer facilities, but we don't know how to do it. Um, and... You know, for a long time, these were fairly sh these were short courses. Um, they assumed a lot of knowledge amongst the researchers, um, and as a whole, um, I think whilst they were useful in some regards, they um, they didn't actually they didn't actually have the insights that you get from adult um, you know from a background in adult education. Very very good technically. Um, we found there were issues because in many ways increasingly researchers were coming saying, I have not seen the command line. I don't know how it works. Um, and these are smart people, right? They just needed that little bit of ha uh, hand to sort of like get them up to the level where they could um, utilise these systems. Because, you know, it's material that you could do in first year, right? Quite easily. But first year is kind of like a crowded space. So we needed, like, these boot camps to give people, you know, a few days of actual solid work on an HPC system where they could make mistakes, where they can make new discoveries, and then they could take it away and actually use it in their research environment. It just required that time. So we started to put these things together. Um, we did a whole range of tailored courses. This thing keeps on popping up, and it can go away for now. So... 
basic HP's basic Linux commands, scripting, um, how to do some mathematical programming using Octave and R and so like some nice open source tools like that, how to submit a job using PBS, whether you're using Talk or Maui or PBS Pro, different schedulers and resource managers, and how to do um, MPI programming as well. It was really, always really exciting. My, um, it was always really exciting that um, you could start off with a group of students who, or re researchers, come into the room, eight out of ten of them had not used the command line and at the end of the third day they were doing MPI programming. They're smart people, they will pick it up, but they need to actually have somebody there to help them along the way and to actually have some structured content. So over the past couple of years, we have had over a thousand student days from a very wide range of um, organisations, as you can see there. RMIT, La Trobe, Swinburne, Victoria University, Macquarie, University of New South Wales, UWA, Australian Institute of Marine Science, and so on and so forth. That's what we do. And the slide will move on if I prod it a couple more times. Come on. Oops. So what, what is going on here? What insights can we gain? Well, just as like a, a two-slide introduction to this like wide field of um, adult education. So a couple of major characteristics worth thinking about. One is the distinction between the adult learner and the child learner. Nice little continuum there is that the adult learner comes there expecting to be treated as an equal, um, has got a wealth of experience, has got intrinsic motivation. They are there because they want to be there and they want to be, be provided the educational tools that satisfy their needs. So that's slightly different to like a classroom approach. And um, I think a lot of educators somehow uh, forget, forget that and they try to get up there and try to do an instructional approach. Now everybody does exist on that continuum, but if you're aware that um, what they call Andrew Goggy, horrible word is slightly different to pedagogy, all right? So adult learners are different to um, younger learners and that has to be introduced and structured into the content. Also, we are looking at a situation of lifelong learning where, of course, the, uh, uh, the old style approach of, you know, you finish school, you do a bit of training and uh, or studying um, and you remain in the job for a very long time does not hold true. There is a, um, a d different, different sort of like approach uh, to like education these days as a result of a change to a post-industrial economy. Um, so... Getting people to actually engage in this education does require to actually sort of go out there and find out what those different people have as their uh, in, intrinsic motivations. It's not a case of you have to be here and you have to learn. The educator actually has to make some work. And one of the things that we discovered in our environment is that we had a very large multicultural audience. That was not something that we were expecting. It was something like about two-thirds of the researchers that came through the door were from a non-English speaking background which really surprised us. So we actually had to structure our courses a little bit more carefully around that as well. Um, the content, so that's our audience. Our content and delivery is, um, is like uh, has had some um, inc incorporation of some of this knowledge as well. So the very basic stuff, objectives, you know, have objectives in your content, make sure that you actually time, you do your lesson timing and revise your material. Something that's very important is providing structural knowledge. Um, you know, some, what does that mean? That is actually sort of like providing building blocks from which people can actually go on and learn uh, further things. Uh, it improves a thing called self-efficiency, which the learner is familiar of what they are capable of doing and not capable of doing based on what they've received. Um, structural, uh, the structural knowledge um, basically establish, also establishes a narrative. So they've actually learned item one before they learn item two. So it's, um, you know, it's basically developing your content around that sort of no notion. Something which has um, come out of a bit of research is that humour is really important as well. Throw in, throw in the occasional joke and apparently people remember the uh, content better. 
So there you go. Uh, grounding of concepts. Concept, I had grounding to a concept. I did encounter uh, some people reviewing some of the material that we had. And they said, oh, there's a mixture of facts and opinions in here. Well, they're not quite opinions if you're actually providing a grounding on why the facts exist. Right? Why is it that open source dominates high performance computing? It's not an accident. Okay? There are reasons on why actually having the availability of the source code improves the optimization of scientific programs and allows scientists to do their researches faster. Um, different disciplines have got different disciplinary based learning styles. If you hear about individual learning styles, throw it out the window, that's nonsense, but disciplines themselves do have learning styles which are most effective. And in the field of computer science, the most effective ways to um, provide, pro impart knowledge is a combination of direct usage, um, from Stephen Levy's old book, The Hacker's Handbook, Yield to the Hands-on Imperative, get the users to sit down, type out the commands, make mistakes. They will learn from their mistakes. Also engage in what they're calling connectivism, basically collaborating with the people immediately around them. Hi, um, I'm having a problem with this. How did you do it? And they showed them how to do it. Overall, you have a learner-teacher environment which is most effective in what um, Lev Vygotsky um, hypothesized in the 1930s um, called the zone of proximal development. And if I get the slide to move along, just one, please. Whee. There we go, three pictures. Remember, I went one, two, three. Okay, so this is what people used to think that a classroom should look like, and they were wrong. This is our development, I guess, if you like, from an, a, um, uh, a, from ch a child to adult to advanced adult education. Start off with, and they do actually all include each other, right? You know, there is a bit, bit of instruction that still actually goes on when you're dealing with advanced adult edu uh, learners, but Ultimately, you'll find that they are more in this connectivist approach. So, instructivism, connect, const, uh, constructivism, connectivism. Here is the ZPD, as they like to do it. Teachers are not very useful here. They're just, just like you know, another person in the room. If a person already knows how to do something, is very competent at it, they don't need the educator there. They can sit down and they can do it themselves. They, um, a teacher will just be sort of like you know, a friend that's helping, helping them out there. If they're out here, um, they, the, the, um, the learner is going to have to be handheld all the way, but the place where they, the uh, teacher can be, imp uh, be really effective is right here, where the learner could fumble their way through, but if they have a, an educator there next to them and helping them out, that is where there is enormous effectiveness. And that is why we like to have fairly small classes. We tend to have classes, uh, maximum number of um, 20. In fact, 20 is probably too much. And we like to do so like, uh, a lot of uh, group exercises. So as a combat, there's a bit of a multimedia performance. I give the presentations out to the group, explaining what's happening. They've got a workbook with them as well. The material's on the screen. They type it up. They collaborate as well. So there are different sort of approaches occurring at the same time. And the immersion of knowledge that they get is a lot, is a lot greater. Um, and it's possibly something that could be imparted upon uh, people who do computer science education elsewhere. There was a, one chap at University of Sydney who started laughing in the midst of one of the classes. And I was like, hey, what's wrong? He's going, I'm just remembering how I used to fall asleep during lectures. I am learning so much today. <laughs> so that was good. And he, he was um, yeah, a very smart cookie. Um, we do do a lot of feedback as well. Every single course like, says, hey, what are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? What content would you like to see? How would that, you know, and that's why we engage in a constant process of revision. There is also a matter that we actually have that as one of the requirements in our ISO certification as well, that you, you know, test your customer satisfaction. So what have we got in terms of our courses? Um, so we have an introductory um, Linux and HPC, how to put your, how to, um, uh, how to d explore the command line environment, how to submit a job, run a few jobs, get your results, 
That's how you do it across a range of applications. We have an intermediate one which introduces people to like, um, some scripting and a little bit of set and orc for tools and things like that. How to combine all that in their PBS scripts, how to run job arrays, interactive jobs um, and job dependencies. Um, then we have an advanced course um, which will delve into so like, you know, the deeper and finer points of um, parallel and cluster computing architecture and runs them through about 30 main functions um, that you get in the MPI standard um, in C and uh, Fortran. We also have courses in math for mathematical programming using Octave and R. Um, and also for interpretive programming languages in Python, because, of course, that's um, very popular in the scientific computing world, or at least in the world for the um, uh, researcher, uh, where there's a whole range of nice little um, additions for that as well. So does all this work? This is a really important question. Does it actually work? Well, we've got a good point at tw end of 2012, because that's where we turned off an old cluster, that's when we rewrote re 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 all our course material. And that is also when two of our universities, La Trobe and RMIT, had previously had very, very similar levels of compute time usage on our clusters. And the changes were quite interesting. Oh, come on. I'm trying to like do a dramatic moment here. There we go. Look at that. So here we go. End of 2012. We've got a cluster called Tango. There was a little bit of a lead over between 2012 and 2013, but you know the main points are there. RMIT 1700 compute hours. La Trobe University 20, 1700 compute hours. La Trobe sends students off to its to the courses. 229 course uh, course days. Uh, sorry, MIT does it. La Trobe not so much. You know, they only had a handful of people um, attend the courses over that two-year period. And the change in hours clocked up is quite significant. Okay? Um, there's not obviously a perfect correlation there, but it's a very, very strong one. Um, we, to their credit, I've got to say that um, La Trobe, um, when this, uh, these results were first published, La Trobe in, ran off and so I got 60 more people into the classes. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to, I'm going to have to have another look to sort of see how that's affected their metrics. So, this is great. This is, you know, uh, this is adult advanced education in the field of research. And, of course, you know, research is basically around finding out stuff that's not known. What about vocational engineering? Um, we are also now moving in the world of vocational engineering in this. We've, uh, you know, if you look around Australia, you'll find that HPC courses are typically left for computer specialists at the postgraduate level, um, but the demand for that is a lot earlier. Yep, very good with that. Um, and that's why we find these three-day boot camps are really handy. But we're also finding that we need to sort of move, these, um, move these elsewhere. We need to introduce the world of high-performance computing into, um, into the, engineering the contemporary engineering environment, um, not just in a research level, okay? Uh, because of those data set, because of those data sets are involved. We need HPC in the field of simulations and prototyping, for example. And this is kind of important. We're talking, there was a little bit of a hint of that in the, in the keynote. The solo residue. What's that? Um, you can, you can incre increase your productivity through sort of like, you know, a, variety, a variety of organisational means. Um, but ultimately, it is technical innovation more than any other cause that, is, um, that um, basically generates um, higher levels of productivity and wealth. Uh, Solo's paper was from around, around about the um, 1960s, and he, at the time, said that technology is actually responsible for 80% of your increase in wealth and productivity. So we need to actually do that now. We need to actually think about terms of um, bringing in um, high-performance computing to provide technical, technical innovation. So we've got two courses. We've had um, a number of meetings with RMIT about this, about introducing it to their School of Vocational Engineering. Um, this will be at the Advanced Diploma or Associate Degree level. Um, the first one is actually about 
building HPC systems. We want to train sort of like engine, some, um, some you know, advanced diploma or associate degree level engineers to look, teach them how to actually put together an HPC system. At the moment, they've got courses for sort of like, you know, Linux um, server administration and things like that. Um, we want to actually have that as a prerequisite for um, putting these things together, start, you know, start starting off and saying, okay, here's your, how you do your racking and stacking, your cabling, uh, this is how you install the resource manager, the job scheduler, um, so on and so forth, and how to run it. Now, ontologically, the existence of the HPC system has to exist before people can use it, and that's the approach we've taken. So that's got a smaller enrolment base, uh, a lower risk, we'll find out how that goes. You know, touch wood planned introduction um, next year. The second one that's been looked at is a more generic one, which would be viral, um, which is on a usage course. Uh, and that would be for a whole range of the advanced manufacturing, civil engineering, aerospace engineering type people using a variety um, of hopefully mainly open source um, um, applications. Um, this is going to use some of the same material as what we, um, you know, the same approach as what we've used in the um, researcher course. Now, there's going to be obviously some slight difference because the audience is going to be slightly different. It's going to be longer courses. These are 80 contact hours, semester, you know, year-long courses. Um, so, uh, people are going, but, you know, the idea is to still sort of take the same approach that sort of, like, you know, um, tries to introduce to a small class a more collaborative approach, uh, tries to provide the, um, tries to provide for, sort of like, uh, continuous assessment for feedback and so forth. Um, this is a big strategic direction, I think. You know, in terms of what um, can be done on a national level. Uh, you know, the general trajectory that we find in the computational world these days is that we are dealing with larger and larger data sets. We're dealing with a need for more precise engineering solutions uh, and greater and greater automation. This is not going to be resolved by people operating their uh, computational and scientific applications on the desktop level. It just cannot be done. Not within a reasonable period of time anyway. So the HPC world is something which require, um, is, going to be, is going to grow and requires some um, intervention about, um, from those research institutes which have traditionally provided them um, and bring them basically to a, um, uh, bring them down to a level where um, other people can use them as, as um, um, in the vocational field as well. And I note that just this, um, in a couple of weeks ago, in fact, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, one of the most famous HPC centres in the world, is now sort of lined up with the Amrinsula um, Polytechnic Institute for precisely in the areas that, we, uh, that I've just discussed today. So they're saying, hey, how do we bring HPC down, um, available to be not just a research tool, but um, a tool for things that are already known um, to directly relate to uh, productive activity. And that brings me to an end. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I have a couple of minutes for questions. Yes, it can be used for urban planning, Pat. <laughs> In fact, it'd be awesome for urban planning. <laughs> Um, thanks, thanks, Liv. Um, I guess one question was you talked about like the idea of the training material and upskilling the people, yep. um, and particularly if you're like looking at smaller organisations in industry, because mm -hmm. I know VPAC worked with Holden and they did a lot of work, but they had a big team. But I mean, is it, I'm I'm sort of thinking about this myself. Is it partly about like training a champion? Who's going to go out there within an organisation beyond the course yep. and keep? No, no, that, that, no, that, no. You're absolutely right about that, and um, that's one of the one of the things which we uh, do tell those people who are attending the course. That's sort of like you know, you will go back and you will be show, you will need to show the rest of your research team how to do this. I mean, it's great when the entire research team turns up, and that does sometimes happen. Um, but quite often, you know, it is basically you know this knowledge gets spread by word of mouth. Um, and 
you know, for people to come back and say, you know, they'll, if two people work on the same data sets and one person's using their desktop and the other person's sort of like using their HPC system, the other, you know, first, you know, that second person's finished it, finished, got their data in the day, and the other person's still chugging away, you go, hey, you know, you should go along to this course, right? <laughs> because, you know, if you're spending all your time waiting for the computer to finish the job you've given it, um, it's not great for your research output. Um, something, of course, also, which you've just reminded me of that also has to be mentioned that's um, related to what you've said, is that whilst all we can, we can provide all this course content, you know, in a you know, Creative Commons friendly, so like open source sort of way, um, it's a little bit like providing code without any programmers. And that's actually why you still need to have um, somebody like myself in a room with people. Right, you know, in in a in a way, I'm sort of like you know explaining the code to the pe to, to the people who are going to be using it. So uh, as much you know, so it's, it's great to actually be able to provide this content to the public and put it out there and say, hey, go for your life. But it still actually does require those adult education skills to deliver it to lear to um, learners. Um, so you've spoken quite eloquently on the importance of training researchers for yep. utilising the latent power of HPC. Mm -hmm. But there's another latent power that you haven't mentioned at all, okay. um, but you'll hear it in most of the other rooms, and that, that's the cloud. Yep. So how do you propose that training researchers um, um, might happen to engage not only in HPC, but other computing resources that are sitting there running idle? That, that look... Um I imagine the educational approach will be similar. Um, I am not sufficiently familiar with the operations to, of, of cloud technologies to actually comment reasonably on it. Um, the metrics I have looked at always seem to tell me that uh, the cloud is slower <laughs> and more expensive, um, but is very, very handy for sort of, um, managers who want to engage in risk, a bit of risk management and so like you know, say, no, um, we're using 100% of what we said we're going to do because that's what we're paying for. <laughs> um, so, but, you know, really I think the insights and of looking at things like, you know, content uh, delivery and audience and um, will still be applicable no matter what technology you're using. Well, once again, thank you, Lev. Thank you very much.